Okay, let's carry on building the theory of root systems. So the last thing we did is I wrote down this uh, function from chambers to bases. Let's maybe just remember a little bit of that. A chamber was a connected component of the space. When you take your Euclidean space and you throw away all of the reflecting hyperplanes, all of those alpha perps hyperplanes orthogonal to all of the roots. And a base was a basis, I used the letter delta for base, it's a basis delta for the Euclidean space consisting of roots. So every root is either a positive sum or a negative sum of the alpha i's. So I mean a, a linear combination of the alpha i's where all the coefficients are positive, uh, 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 greater than or equal to zero, that's a positive sum, uh, or where all of the coefficients are less than or equal to zero, that's a negative sum. Okay, so chambers and bases so the theorem said that bases existed, uh, and uh, that was a theorem I'm not going to go through the proof of, but uh, the proof was a construction. So you pick a chamber, and there was a way to construct a base, delta sub C, out of that chamber. By definition, that was all the roots, so that the hyperplane alpha perp is in the boundary of the chamber C, and... Uh, all the points in that chamber are on the same side of the hyperplane alpha perp as alpha is. That's what this condition is saying. It's saying that lambda is on the same side of alpha perp as alpha. And I've written for every lambda in C, but actually you just need this condition for some lambda in C, then it's automatic for all of the other ones. So you've kind of got to really think in terms of in terms of geometry here, this is something very concrete. Uh, okay, so, so the theorem said that bases existed. In fact, it said that every base for the root system arises from a chamber in this way. In other words, that this map that I give here is actually onto. It's actually rather easy to see that this map is not only onto, as stated last time, it's also one-to-one. -one. So actually this is a bijection between chambers and bases. I mean, given delta you can obviously recover, C, recover the chamber C uh, by just taking the intersection over all of the roots in the base um, of, of those half spaces. So you intersect all the half spaces, satisfying those inequalities, all half spaces, the same size side of those uh, hyperplanes as uh, uh, alpha perp as alpha is. Yeah, and, and that intersection of those half spaces recovers the chamber C. So you should just kind of think that through again in two dimensions when it's kind of blindingly obvious in these, these rank two root systems that I've copied down at the bottom of this page so that you can see what's going on. I'm going to assume from now on that we've fixed a choice of what I'll call the fundamental chamber. And that choice of uh, fundamental chamber gives us a base, the corresponding base, I'll just write delta for that. That's the base corresponding to that fundamental chamber. And I'll always write this delta as alpha 1 up to alpha L, 
So L here, that's the rank of the root system. And that's the same thing as the dimension of the Euclidean space E. And I'll, I'll call these guys, these alpha i's, I'll call these the simple roots. So everything depends on this choice of fundamental chain, but that determines a base for the root system. Hence, it determines a set of simple roots. Uh, and I'm just going to always index these simple roots 1 through L in some way. I guess that, that, that might be handy to have that index set. I'll, I'll often write capital I for the index set, just because I'm used to doing that. So the base is actually the set of alpha I, little i's for little i in big I. That's kind of a nice index set to have floating around. So back in the root 2 case, um, we kind of did that last time, right? I've drawn all the rank two root systems, and in each of them I've shaded in blue the fundamental chamber. So if you pick this fundamental chamber, well then the corresponding base is alpha 1, alpha 2, those roots. A2, so the roots are the crosses. There were these six roots in the, in the, in the A2 root system, uh, and uh, so this, this one is, is the only one where the uh, reflecting hyperplanes are not in the same direction as some of the roots. So I've drawn the reflecting hyperplanes in blue. There's my choice of fundamental chamber and the corresponding base is these two guys. So this is alpha one perp, this is alpha two perp. The intersection of those two kind of positive half spaces determined by alpha one and alpha two, that's this uh, fundamental chamber. And so on B2, there's my choice of chamber. G2, there's my choice of chamber. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of refer back to these rank two cases two-dimensional geometry is easy uh, and actually it's not not so misleading just to think about the two-dimensional case and all the definitions that we're doing okay so that's just notation I'm, I'm assuming henceforth we fixed such a choice of fundamental chamber equivalently we fixed a choice of base equivalently we fixed a choice of simple roots equivalently we fixed a decomposition of the set of all roots as a disjoint union of positive roots And negative roots. You know, part of the definition of base is that uh, every root can either be written as an all positive linear combination of the simple roots or an all negative linear combination of the simple roots. Okay, so that's where we're at. So I'm going to need a bunch of lemmas. So I've already given you two lemmas, uh, but it's going to kind of carry on like that. So I'm going to number all the lemmas in this chapter. So the third lemma, I want to show that uh, every root alpha belongs to at least one base. So let's quickly prove this is this. So this is kind of the last kind of really geometric place in this game. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pick. So, so we're going to take an alpha root. I'm going to pick gamma in the hyperplane orthogonal to alpha that's not on any other hyperplane. for beta different from plus or minus alpha. Remember, the only multiple of a root is, is, is a plus or minus that root. Okay, so I can do this. I can pick something in the hyperplane orthogonal to alpha that's not on any of, of those other hyperplanes. And then I'm going to move just a tiny bit. From gamma to some really nearby guy, gamma prime. So gamma prime alpha is some little epsilon bigger than zero. And all the other gamma prime betas for beta not equal to plus or minus alpha, uh, all of these guys are still bigger than epsilon. Okay, so you can do that because you're just trying to avoid finitely. All of these gamma betas are positive. Uh, you can move just a tiny little bit away to gamma prime, 
so that uh, you're making the, the, the gamma prime alpha smaller than, than uh, all of those other gamma prime betas. And then you just have to let C prime. And so, that, so this, this ensures that this uh, gamma prime is not on any of these uh, hyperplanes. So it lies in some chamber. And so let's let C prime be the chamber. containing this gamma prime. And so then this, this ensures that this, this choice of gamma prime, it ensures that actually uh, alpha perp is a bounding hyperplane. For C prime, uh, so actually we have that uh, this original alpha, it's in the base associated to this C prime. Okay, so that, that kind of proves the lemma. Okay, great. So that, that, that's useful. Every root belongs to at least one base. That's lemma three. Okay, now let's come to the next important definition, the vial group. So I'm going to denote this always by W. It's a subgroup of the general linear group GLE. In fact, it's a subgroup of the orthogonal group, O of E, right? Isometries with respect to our given inner product on the space E. And so by definition, it's going to be the subgroup generated by all of those reflections. Let's maybe add in the word reflection. It's kind of important that W is generated by reflection. So, it's, so it's, a, it's a subgroup of the isometry group of this Euclidean space generated by finitely many reflections. So this is kind of such an important point. So being, being a reflection, right, S alpha squared is the identity and uh, S alpha fixes the hyperplane alpha per point-wise. Okay, so that, that's basically uh, the definition of a reflection given that S alpha isn't the identity. Okay, uh, so um, by axiom three of root system, W of R is R, right, i.e. W acts on the set R, and it, and it acts faithfully. Right, so R is a subset of the Euclidean space E, but, but these roots are just permuted around by W because all of the generators S alpha of W fix R. So we actually write it like that. S alpha of R. That was exactly our axiom three. Okay, so the vial group acts on R. It acts faithfully as R spans E. So hence, actually, although I've defined W as sitting inside the uh, general linear group GLE or, or the isometry group O of E, in fact, uh, this gives you an embedding of W into the symmetric group on the set R. And that's important because this is a finite group. So we've just shown that the vial group is finite. The representation E of W, the kind of defining representation, is going to be called the reflection representation. Of W, so that's that's just one piece of terminology I might use, and I'm going to let uh, S sub I be S sub alpha I for short, and I'm going to call these guys S one up to S L. I'm going to call these the simple reflections. So this, of course, depends on our choice of 
that fundamental chamber, hence our choice of base, so that we know what the simple roots alpha i are. And let me note finally, this is something that gets used a lot, that if you take some reflection s alpha in one of these hyperplanes orthogonal to a root, and you conjugate by an element of w, you get another reflection. This is for alpha in r, w in w. That's something that you will know very well. You conjugate a reflection, uh, you get another reflection. Uh, one more definition. For a root alpha, I'm going to, I'm going to let height of alpha be the sum of the coefficients when you write alpha as a linear combination of the alpha i's. Okay, so I, I guess all we know at this point is that all of these ci's are either real numbers greater than or equal to zero, or they're all less than or equal to zero. So, so this height, I guess it's, it's a positive real number if it's a positive root and a negative real number if it's a negative root. But actually, uh, those heights are all actually integers. So this is the next lemma. Every positive root is just an n linear combination of simple roots. In fact, it's even a little bit stronger than that. You can write alpha as a sum, alpha i1 up to alpha i h of simple roots. So i1 through i h, they're just between 1 and l, our index set for the simple roots, in such a way that all of these kind of partial sums, alpha i1 up to alpha i k, is also a positive root for all k between 1 and h. Okay, this h here then is the height in this sense, uh, and so it's a natural number. So let's prove this. If alpha is simple, there's nothing to prove, it's just an alpha i. So take alpha positive root that's not simple. Then there must be some alpha i, some simple root, so that that inner product alpha alpha i is positive. To see this, I mean, if you had if alpha was a linear combination of ci alpha i's, and if alpha alpha i was less than or equal to zero for all i, well, you'd get that the inner product of alpha with itself, which is, of course, greater than zero, because uh, we're in an inner product space, um, that would be uh, alpha alpha, so it would be the sum of ci alpha alpha i, but these guys are all greater than or equal to zero, and if those were all less than or equal to zero, then that whole thing would be less than or equal to zero, which is a contradiction, right? Okay, so pick such an i. And then alpha minus alpha i is a root by lemma 1. And it must be positive. As the sum j different from i. So alpha minus alpha i has alpha j with positive coefficient. So our alpha is not a simple root, so it's not just a scalar multiple of alpha i. When you expand alpha in terms of the simple roots, there must be some alpha j different from alpha i appearing. 
that also appears in this, this alpha minus alpha i. So it's got some simple root coefficient positive, hence it's a positive root. But now this guy, its height is one smaller. It's positive root, and you just repeat the argument. Good, so let's, let's look at the next lemma now. I'm sorry, there's quite a lot of rather short but somewhat technical lemmas in this, this development of root systems. So the next lemma says that if you take a simple reflection, so you take some i in i, the simple reflection si, remember si is reflection in alpha i, it permutes all of the positive roots except for alpha i, and of course si of alpha i is minus alpha i. So it negates alpha i, but all the other positive roots just get permuted amongst themselves. It follows that if you apply si to this rather special element rho, of the Euclidean space E, let me write down what rho is, it's a half the sum of the positive roots. If you apply Si to rho, you just get rho minus alpha i. So this, this being rather an important thing, I'm going to put a little box around the definition of rho there, so maybe you remember that. I'll always use rho for this rather special element of the Euclidean space, a half the sum of the positive roots. Si of rho is rho minus alpha i. This second part is immediate because you just know what Si does. It just permutes around all the terms of that summation except for alpha i, and it sends alpha i to minus alpha i. So we just need to prove the first part. And this is, this is really quick. I mean, you just take uh, an alpha in r plus that's not alpha i. So that means that alpha is not in the span of alpha i, because the only multiple of alpha i that's a root is a plus or minus alpha i. So this alpha, when you expand it in terms of the simple roots, it must involve some other alpha j. with positive coefficient. We now know with positive integer coefficient, by the way. And then you just think about what does Si of alpha look like? Well, by definition, it's alpha minus alpha, alpha i check, alpha i. So the only simple root coefficient that's changed is the alpha i one. The alpha j coefficient's still there. It's still positive. So this is a root, and it must be positive by its alpha j coefficient. OK, so when you apply si to one of these roots, you get another positive root. It just remains to check that this uh, si of alpha cannot be equal to alpha i. Well, if it was, then alpha would be equal to si of alpha i, which is minus alpha i, which is not, because it's a positive root. Okay, so the last one of our technical lemmas, probably the most important, actually, it's kind of rather neat. So um, I'm going to take a bunch of simple reflections. And I'm going to assume that when you apply them all the way up to si t minus 1, to alpha i t, that's a negative root. Okay, so I'm sorry about the double sub subscripts here. There's no real way to do this any other way. So we've got a bunch of simple reflections, and you apply them to alpha i t. It's negative, and the lemma says that there exists some u between 1 and t, 
such that the uh, original product of all t simple reflections is equal to the product just up to u minus 1, and skipping up si u, and from u plus 1 onwards to t minus 1. It looks a bit technical, but you see on the left-hand side there's a product of t reflections. And on the right-hand side we've deleted the last one, the sit, and we've also deleted one from inside, the siu. So here there are t minus 2 reflections. This is sort of a deletion property. So the proof is, is actually kind of nice. We're going to let u be minimal. So that if you apply from u plus 1 onwards up to i t minus 1 to alpha i t, that's a positive root. But when you apply one more reflection at the beginning, you apply s i u at the beginning, you become negative for the first time. Okay, so this, this u will definitely be in that range by the hypotheses. Okay, so when you apply s i u, this positive root becomes negative. So we can use lemma 5. And by SIU, it permutes all of the positive roots except for alpha IU. That's the only one it sends to negative. So lemma 5 tells us that this sequence of simple reflections applied to alpha i t must actually be the simple root alpha i u. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take s i t and I'm going to conjugate it by s i u plus 1 up to s i t minus 1. So maybe let's call this guy w. So I'm going to conjugate it by this thing. I'm just putting here W again. But you know, when you conjugate the simple reflection, this is an S alpha. So maybe if I name alpha is alpha I T. So this is conjugating a simple conjugating a reflection by w, so it's the reflection in w of alpha. But right here tells us what w of alpha is. It's alpha i u. So this is s i u. And then let's just take this equation and rewrite it a little bit. s i u plus 1, s i t minus 1. S I T, it's equal to S I U, and then I'm just kind of moving this stuff over to the right hand side here. So this is again S I U plus 1 up to S I T minus 1. That's what we've shown. And I guess I'm going to multiply on the left by S I 1 up to S I U minus 1. Uh, and if I finally multiply on the right by SIT, it'll cancel the SIT off that side and it'll move it over to that side. To finish the argument. Okay, so that's all the technical lemmas. Um, so let's now actually prove a theorem. The vial group W is actually generated by its simple reflections. S1 up to S that. Okay, so the, that the notion depends on the choice of base, but we fixed that at the beginning today. Moreover, there are bijections between W and the set of chambers, between W and the set of bases. 
So here, this was what we constructed already. So we, we, we constructed this bijection already. That was the bijection sending chamber C to base delta C. Uh, so I, I'm going to write down the bijection from the vial group to chambers is just sending W to W of C uh, and the bijection from W to base C is just sending W to W of delta. So here, C and delta are, are the initially chosen fundamental chamber and the corresponding base that I, that I picked at the beginning today. So it's sort of somehow, sometimes it's useful to talk in terms of chambers and sometimes it's useful to talk in terms of bases and we've got this canonical bijection between chambers and bases from the beginning. So what I'm saying is that just this action of the vial group on the fundamental chamber gives a bijection between the elements of W and the chambers. Equivalently, the action of W on the given choice of base that we fixed at the beginning gives a bijection between the vial group and the set of bases. Okay, so we're going to prove this. So actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to let W prime be the group just generated by the simple reflection. So that's a subgroup of W. I'm going to prove the bijections with W replaced by W prime, and then we'll show W equals W prime at the end. And let, maybe let's note that the diagram commutes, obviously. And we've already got this isomorphism at the bottom. So let me see. I'm going to prove that this map is surjective. And then I think I'm going to prove that this map is injective. Uh, but that does the job uh, because that diagram definitely commutes. So, you know, I'm sort of identifying chambers with bases really here. So to show that this map is onto, I'm going to take some gamma. that's not on any hyperplanes, right? So, so gamma is going to lie in, in one of these connected components. Right, that choice of gamma is just picking out a connected component, picking out one of these chambers. I'm going to show that there exists some W, not in, in the vial group W, but in this subgroup generated by the simple reflections, some W in W prime. So that W of gamma is in our fundamental chamber, uh, that'll show that uh, W prime acts transitively on chambers. So this will show that that left-hand map is indeed on two. Okay, so I've, I've fixed some gamma and it's in one of these chambers. I'm going, to I'm going to pick W in W prime so that this uh, real number, W of gamma rho, is maximal. This is this special rho that I fixed earlier. I'll remind you one more time what it is. It's the half the sum of the positive roots. Okay, so there's this just finitely many real numbers there because uh, our vial group is finite. So just pick, pick W so that that's maximal. And now let's look at W of gamma rho. By the maximality, it's greater or equal to this. This is for any I in I. Right, so, so the maximality gives us that, that, that inequality. But this is the same as W gamma SI of rho, because the vial group is reflection, so it preserves this uh, inner product that we have. And we know SI of rho 
is rho minus alpha i. We proved that uh, earlier. Um, and so what have we got here? We've got w gamma rho minus w of gamma alpha i. Okay, so this guy here is greater than or equal to this guy here. This shows w of gamma alpha i is greater than or equal to zero for all i. Since gamma is not on any hyperplanes, any of these reflecting hyperplanes, nor is w of gamma, so actually this is positive for all i, but that shows exactly that w of gamma is in the fundamental chamber. Okay, so that's the surjectivity. Now I'm going to show that actually the other map, the map from W to bases, is injective. So for that I need to take some uh, non-identity element W in W prime and assume that W on our base is just delta. And we need to get a contradiction out of this. I can write W as a product of simple reflections because it's in W prime. And let's do this with the R here being minimal. So if I apply this sequence of simple reflections to alpha I R, that's in the base, right? And W sends the base to the base. So this is positive. Now this uh, alpha IR at the end sends alpha, this SIR at the end sends alpha R IR to its minus. So if I just get rid of that last guy, this will be minus what we just had. So this will be a negative root. So now we're going to apply lemma six. We deduce that uh, this product, SI1 up to SIR, can actually be written as SI1 up to IU minus 1, U plus 1 up to SIR minus 1. But that contradicts the minimality of R. OK, so now we've shown that our map are both bijections. And when you're really nearly done, we finally need to show the w equals w prime. So this is the last uh, thing we've got to do. So for this, I'm going to take any root alpha and we need to show that the reflection in alpha, that generator of the vial group W, actually lies in W prime. So that uh, W prime has every generator, that'll do the job. But now we can use the very first lemma that we proved today. There's a base containing alpha. Uh, and uh, what we've shown here is that uh, W acts transitively, sorry, W prime acts transitively on bases, that surjectivity of that right-hand map, it exactly establishes that. So we get a W in W prime with uh, this alpha in W of delta. So that means what the W inverse of alpha is in delta. So that's some alpha i, some i in i. 
And now let's look at uh, W S I W inverse. Well, this is S W of alpha I. W of alpha I is S alpha. But uh, S I is in W prime and W is in W prime. So this shows that S alpha is in W prime. That proves the theorem. Okay, so now we've, we've finally proved that this W is actually generated by all of those simple reflections. And it's very reasonable to ask what are the relations. between these guys. And it's easy to come up with some relations. I mean, we know that si squared is 1 for all i. If we take i not equal to j, um, there's also some more relations we can see right away. So if you take a... Pro so you go si, sj, si, you alternate a total of mij times that's equal to sj, si, sj, a total of mij times, where, well, I need a little table here. mij is going to be 2, 3, 4, or 6. And it all depends on which of the cases in our table from last time you're in. It all depends on the values of these numbers. You remember these guys, these were either 0, 1, 2, or 3. So these were our cases, right? This was uh, when you were in an A1, A1, or an A2, or a B2, or a G2. So this is the, the rank 2 type. So I've got to prove that for you. Uh, so this just follows just by inspection of our rank 2 pictures. So let's go back to them. So if it's A1 cross A1, this is S1 right here, and this is S2. And if we start with the chamber C, and we start reflecting. So what can we do to C? We can reflect it with S1. This gives us S1 of C. And then we can reflect, do it in S2. This is S2, S1 of C. Or we could take C and do S2 to it and then reflect it in S1. Ooh, that, that was not good. That was meant to be S2, S1. Or you could you can take you can first reflect it down here and then then do S1 to that guy, and that's S1, S2 of C. These are equal, and because of what we proved, this vial group acts uh, uh, kind of in a regular way on the fundamental chamber. So S1, S2 of C being S2, S1 of C, that exactly proves what we were after. In the A1, A1 case, S1, so that's when I'm claiming that this Mij is 2. That's just saying, saying that S1, S2 equals S2, S1. I guess that was a really obvious case because those reflections were at right angles, so they obviously commute. But I just showed you the method that's going to work in general. So in, in uh, A2, so let me see, this is the, the hyperplane orthogonal to alpha 2. That's alpha 1. And you just track this chamber C. If I do, if I do S1 to it, I get over here. And then if I do S2 to that, so I'm going to reflect this chamber in that hyperplane. It goes to this chamber down at the bottom left. So this is S2, S1 of C. And then if I do S1 to that, I get up here S1, S2, S1 of C. Or I can start with C and I can do S2 to it to get down here. This is S2 of C. And then I do S1 to that. This is S1, S2 of C, and then I do S2 to that, I get S2, S1, S2 of C. So these are equal, and so on. You see, that's how it, how it all goes. So I'll quickly do it for the other two to prove all of these relations. So this is uh, S1, this is S2, for G2, this is S2, and that's S1, and let me quickly fill in. So this is C, this is S2 of C, this is S1 of C, 
this is going to be S1, S2 of C. This is going to be S2, S1 of C. And then here we've got S1, S2, S1 of C. And here we've got S2, S1, S2 of C. And then finally, this last chamber, the furthest away from C, you can get in two different ways. You can either do S2, S1, S2, S1 of C, or you can do S1, S2, S1, S2 of C. And so this is exactly this relation when that M is 4. And the last one, uh, well, uh, this you, you, you do the same thing, and you're going to find that, in fact, you get uh, S1, S2, S1, S2, S1, S2 of C is equal to S2, S1, S2, S1, S2, S1 of C in there with the length 6 appearing in, in that. So you have to kind of push it all the way around this picture. So all of those relations hold. That's kind of the case analysis, just inspecting the rank 2 picture. And the final thing to be said today, in fact, these give all relations. This is a full set of relations for W. Let me just write it, write it here. So W is generated by S1 up to SL, subject just to the relations SI squared equals 1, and SI, SJ equals SJ, SI, where you put MIJ times here, MIJ defined in the table, but I not equal. So this, this is a very beautiful and wonderful presentation. I'm not going to prove it. I, I've just checked that the relations hold. Uh, but this shows that W is what's called a coxeter group. This presentation is, is the presentation of a coxeter group. In fact, it's a very special. Vial groups are very special coxeter groups. They're finite, what are called crystallographic coxeter groups. With this, with this very special presentation, very few possibilities for these MIJs in vial groups. But this general form of the presentation, that's the, that's the presentation of a general Coxeter group.